So uh, what I thought we could do is just go over briefly the basic concepts, principles, as an overview that Reardon and Hamelsrud identified in their, in their work that we read. And beginning with, with Reardon in her review and projection. But she was, uh, I th believe that piece was originally commissioned by UNESCO uh, as an overview of the field that she put together for UNESCO and then published elsewhere. Uh, written in the late 90s, around 2000. 99, 2000, something like that. So, um, Reardon begins the, uh, with the perception that there's no, there's not one standard field of peace education, a variety of sub fields loosely held together by a few common purposes. And she attempts to uh, identify those common purposes. And she hones in on the uh, idea of a humane society uh, as the major goal of peace education that's shared across many approaches and many conceptions. Humane, we could interpret the meaning of humane, just, respectful, nonviolent, uh, et cetera. And there are Connected to that goal are some shared assumptions about a humane society. That a humane society derives from positive, mutually beneficial relations among members of the society, both cor as a cor corporate body and, and individually, both politically and individually. That peace can only be, can, uh, only be attained under the existence of the fundamental preconditioned a mutually advantageous circumstances, and we and the goal is to uh, to understand what cons constitutes such circumstances, and seek to maintain them. So those are commonly shared assumptions. Perhaps they're they're rather abstract, general assumptions. And peace then is possible when society agrees that the overarching purpose of public policies is the achievement and mutually beneficial circumstances that enhance the life possibilities of all. Such an agreement is sometimes identified as universal respect for human rights. It, also interp it is also interpreted as, as an agreement to renounce the use of violence within the society and to develop nonviolent processes for dispute, settlement, and decision-making. And this is at least at the, on the level of, of common national values. Not always enacted, of course. And, I'm, and she points out there's no generally firm held agreement on these principles at the level of world society. So you might find them in certain national communities, but not worldwide, although there's many attempts to articulate them. And there's some agreement around rights and protocols and international organization, international law, but lots of disagreements to, and conflict about it. It's interesting that she's defining here the uh, pe a peaceful society as one that's based on agreement uh, around rights, or and rights are uh, uh, an element of justice, an expression of justice. So it agree it's a, maybe, and this strikes one as uh, very similar to a social contract point of view. That uh, mutual agreement and acknowledgement of a set of principles in the society that govern and regulate the society, or the social cooperation amongst 
members of the society is what it, what what is the essence of justice and thereby peace okay. Something like the question of human rights, it seems to be at this level of, of nation or, or law and, and less of, of individual. Like, um, I know we had a discussion about Well, you seem to be saying making a distinction between the individual and the individual relations with others and how society is organized, and the structure and organization of society. Mm -hmm. Is that mm -hmm. accurate? Yeah. And that's, those are two different levels of, of uh, ethical consideration. And justice mainly pertains to the societal level rather than individual or social justice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as does human rights. Does that mean that if So you, you someone's dishonest or something with in in relationship to someone else and you know, we wouldn't say that's a matter of justice. You violated my human rights by lying to me about where you were last night. Uh, you know it it's an ethical, uh, it's an ethical consideration, but uh, it's not a matter of justice per se. Right? It and it may be violent. You know, there's a certain violence there, lying, deceiving someone. So that there, there are, there's different orders or levels of moral consideration from the individual, even within oneself, right relationship to oneself. One could, one's conception of one's own good might, is a moral consideration to individual relationships with others, to groups, you know, to families, to groups, communities, nations, the world. So there are different uh, levels. I think different approaches to peace education focus on different levels. So, for example, conflict resolution can, can focus very mi on a micro level, uh, on the individual level. You know, how, to, how do I resolve conflicts with my friends, with my coworkers, with my classmates, um, my colleagues? And that's not about the social system per se, although there might be connections to it. The, the levels may be are interconnected in many cases, but, but the focus um, can be at a different level. And so the approach to is it interesting. The approach to peace education may is in part determined by what level. And, and Hamel's rule was Magnus was getting at this, I think. That, it's a decision that you make in terms of the relate the the level of macro and micro and the relationship between them. It's a decision to make educational what what you're going to focus on what level you're going to be more macro more or micro. How are you going to are you going to look at the connection between the macro and the micro in your design of, of the content? Um, 
of the educational experience. There, uh, not only I think of it, there's a very nice uh, chart developed by George Lopez, who's a professor at Notre Dame, that speaks to this. I'll, I'll, I'll dig that up. He's now the Vice President for Academic Affairs at the University, uh, the U.S. Institute for Peace. Just appointed. Noted Peace Scholar. But he, he, he worked this, like it's almost like a table, as a means of, well, what, what are you going to focus on? So I, I, I'll, I'll find, I have that somewhere. That relates to it. I, I, sh I should have thought of it. It just came to me. But that's an interesting, that's an interesting question of level and is a defining, defines one's approach. So one could, you know, it's a, it's a big umbrella, potential, big umbrella, it is a big umbrella. So what level? They have a point. Yeah. They have a point. It's a good point. Yeah. 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 Interesting. Important, very important consideration. So Reardon here is making the point that human rights is central to uh, to peace, and thereby human rights education central to peace education. And then uh, peace education is the transmission of knowledge about requirements of the obstacles to and possibilities for achieving and maintaining peace. Training in skills for interpreting the, the knowledge and the development of reflective and participatory capacities for applying the knowledge to overcome to overcoming problems and achieving possibilities. One definition. <laughs> I think she's suggesting in this that this is a perhaps a, a general conception. common to the various approaches. This is about knowledge and skill and capacity. Knowledge, skill, capacity. That leads to some action, solving problems, achieving something. Yeah. Knowledge, skill, capacity, action. 
That's a good question. <laughs> we'll see if we can explore that question going forward. Well, I tend to think of capacities in terms of capabilities. The ability, the capability to do or to be what one reason one has reason to value. Or in this case, the capability to do and to be. what is necessary to transform society, respond in a peaceful way, nonviolent way, on whatever level. But that, you know, that I think that's, it's you, you know, see it a lot, I don't know if it's precisely defined ever. <laughs> work to be done. Yes. <laughs> the general uh, concept that peace education is learner-centered, and that the centering takes place with the focus of the relationship between teachers and learners in the learning process. And that the learning that the concerns of the developmental level of learners is as important as the subject matter. I think this is, this is common in varieties of conceptions of peace education that it's learner-centered or student-centered. And that there's a more, it's more of a dialogical relationship between teacher and student. Although Reardon uses the word transmission of knowledge here. Yeah. Maybe the difference. Is it a person that does it? Yeah. So learner centered. Yeah. Go ahead. Are you saying that it's? Some might say that. It depends on how you would define transmission. But a, a monological pedagogy is often referred to as a transmission model. In the banking, in various terms, the banking concept. Put deposits in students' minds. You test them to see if they remember. <laughs> Nunji makes the important distinction between education for peace and education about peace. Education for peace, education to create the preconditions for the achievement of peace. Education about peace is education for the development and practice of institutions and processes that comprise a peaceful social order. And then there's peace knowledge, peace research, peace study, knowledge pertaining to peace education. But the dis education for peace, education about peace, is an important distinction. Uh, while both are uh, indispensable components, 
Most traditionalists would argue that without the particular ca capacities and skills that comprise the learning objections of blah, blah, blah. So traditional peace education, essential peace education, is uh, education about peace. Education for peace, uh, primarily concerned with knowledge and skills, oh, sorry, related to the requirements and obstacles to the achievement of, of peace. So it's a focus on, um, on the preconditions for achieving peace. And the focus is I've been on international, multicultural, and environmental education. I think this slide is messed up, I apologize. So uh, international, international understanding, uh, cultural understanding, multiculturalism, and anti-racist understanding, uh, tolerance, environmental understanding, among other things, uh, as uh, fostering knowledge and understanding about obstacles and necessary conditions for for achieving peace. And this expands the umbrella of peace education to include a variety of things, uh, potentially. Global education. But educa uh, education about peace uh, is essential peace education. It addresses what peace is, its essence, and assumes that without knowledge of it, uh, it can't be achieved. That peace knowledge is essential for the achievement of peace. And here we have uh, human rights education, conflict resolution, tradition, and comprehensive peace education. Primarily concerned with avoiding, reducing, and eliminating violence. Is this distinction clear? Education for versus education about. What do you think? Um, no, I think that's educate in this definition. I think that's more education about peace. Yes. Not a change, perhaps society, institution. Yeah. That's probably too narrow to be drawn, uh, but you're. Uh, it's in the right direction. So uh, education for pieces, we have all these obstacles, you know, racism and cultural prejudice and 
the gender insensitivity and et cetera, and, uh, or lack of understanding of cultures. Oh, look at those people over there. They, they're, they're barbarians. Um, and so the idea of, of culture for peace is to uh, educate, to inform better uh, future citizens to have a deeper understanding and sensitivity and tolerance, perhaps, uh, for a variety of the elements of human society and, hu and human beings that, that tend to get in the way, maybe, yeah. or maybe our sources of, of violence, of violent conflict. And this might include. Education for peace might might also include understanding of structural injustice, structural violence, how social stratification works, and how economic structures lead to poverty and unfair distributions of resources, etc. Et So you, you probably need both. I, I think you do need both are indispensable for and about. And about is how do, how do we transform or and ultimately perhaps how do we create a, how do we transition to a culture of peace from a culture of violence? Then there's the historical development, traditional essential peace education focused on war prevention, nonviolence, world order studies, nuclear education, comprehensive ed peace education, ecological and cooperative education. In the 1970s, with the Paulo Freire, and well, we're going to look directly at critical peace education in a few weeks of Paulo Freire's work. I don't know, are you familiar with Paulo Freire? Okay. Okay. He, uh, he wrote a very influential book called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. He's a Brazilian and he uh, professionally worked with adults, illiterate adults in uh, in Brazil, and his method of literacy education was uh, not only to teach adults to read and write, uh, but to empower them politically. And he did that through a particular method of, of a dialogical pedagogy, a problem-posing pedagogy. And we'll, we'll look at the details of that, of that later. But that uh, Frarian dialogical pedagogy as a response to social injustice and oppression, and that that was his focus. So these were oppressed people, uh, and that it, through a particular kind of education, they would could be empowered and liberated from their oppression, and be able to transform their be agents of transformation in their society through this his educational approach. And that became, that was very influential in peace education circles as well, his, his thinking, beginning in the, in the 1970s. And a whole approach to peace education, referred to as critical peace education, grew out of a Frarian perspective. And then uh, values inquiry which critical peace education was a part, but also world order studies and the world order models project 
was to look at uh, ethical values and moral considerations and how the world system worked. Um, war prevention, conflict resolution, human rights education. Uh, Reardon's own conception of comprehensive peace education, ecology, and cooperative education. Many of these be are, are approaches, these are approaches to peace education that evolved in different historical periods that are still being practiced in camp propon proponents. And we'll, we'll look at uh, actually all of these. So maybe conflict. Yeah. Well, conflict resolution runs throughout. So this, this is a rich, rich hitch history of, of development of, of various approaches. And that uh, that moved the field to uh, eventually to, especially beginning in the 70s, to a transformative perspective. That uh, an education for transformation of the society, as well as an education to transform human consciousness. Was uh, the purpose of education. And that peace should be the purpose of all forms of education. That it should uh, pervade, that concern should pervade the whole system of education. Yeah. You know, all these things. And then the beginning in the 90s, middle, late 90s, uh, this idea of a culture of peace emerged and edu educated for a culture of peace. And that conception is still very much being developed in many different ways. That a major part of the problem was that we would, our culture was violent, and that if we're going to make any headway uh, towards a just peace, we have to change the culture, towards a culture of peace, on, on, on many levels, perhaps all levels, to try to move towards a culture of peace. And this would be a transformative approach and that we needed to, peace educators needed to confront the real challenge of cultural, of cultural change. And that uh, entailed uh, thinking about consciousness and how certain cultural assumptions condition consciousness. And how education, we needed to explore the nature of consciousness and how education can transform consciousness as a, a condition for the transformation of society and, cult and the culture. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. We have to, uh, the culture of peace suggests we have to look 
inside to our self-concept, our identity. Perhaps uh, along the lines of what Pinker was driving at, to look at our inner demons and cultivate our better angels, to borrow his language. But the, the transformation of society requires the transformation of consciousness, our consciousness. So peace education is both, from this perspective, about the transformation of the culture and society as well as the transformation of ourselves, which are interconnected. Yes. Yes, they're interconnected. And it flows both ways. Culture conditions us a certain way, shapes us a certain way. We shape it in certain certain ways. It's hard to, it's a two-way dynamic. And that education, peace education, needs to consider that closely. When, when Reardon wrote this, that was just emerging, I think. I think, was it the UN or UNESCO that really focused on the idea of a culture of peace after that? There were campaigns. Yeah. yeah. And that uh, this would be prophetic. Mainly in the in the former Yugoslavia, that was a, yeah in the nineties. Yeah. yeah, the Clinton administration. There had been there were historical precedents for humanitarian intervention prior to that. The uh, Indian military intervened in eastern Pakistan, now Bangladesh, to stop uh, a genocide in the 60s. 60s. Uh, they, and they, they you know, the mil Pakistani military was committing genocide, and the Indian army stopped them. They entered, they Intervened. And that led to uh, bang, uh, establish the independence of Bangladesh. And then, uh, you know, Bosnia and uh, Kosovo, etc. And then Somalia, yeah. After that, Somalia. And that was militarily ineffective. And then Rwanda came right after that. And because of the experience in Somalia, the U.S. was, the Clinton administration was very overly cautious. And Clinton later said, uh, apologized that we should have done something. And the Europeans, the Actually, the Belgians uh, spent, sent, they had a rela you know, relationship with, colonial relationship with Rwanda, sent uh, their special forces to evacuate the Europeans from the country, airlifted them out. And then that was a gre actually a green light for, for the massacre to start. And they could have, you know, the the Belgian government could have stopped it. NATO, the U.S., you, could, you know, it was a very primitive. If I, uh, they were machetes, people in the street killing each other with machetes. So. Uh, 
And the UN was there, UN peacekeepers were there, and there was a failure of the UN as well. They weren't given, they didn't have a mandate to intervene, they didn't have the capacity really to intervene. But they were told not to get involved. It was a disaster. So, and then the, Sud the Sudan, which we didn't, well, it resolved itself. So that, that's a major, uh, relatively recent development in uh, international law and international relations. And um, the legal and ethical justifications for intervention have, are work, being worked on within the dress war tradition. When is it legitimate to intervene? When is, it, when is there a duty to intervene? Those kind of questions. Yeah. So, um, a cultural and peace, culture of peace idea um, is transformative and Reardon uses the word prophetic. It's not just about taking a perspective, it's of envisioning the future uh, and acting to uh, create that future. And a movement away from an oppositional stance to a transformative stance. The oppositional position is very common. Oh, that's unjust. This is wrong. That shouldn't be that way. But and there, there it stops. So he's suggesting have to move to thinking about how to make it different, how to transform the situation, and that's perhaps at the heart of an education for and about peace. So Reardon gives it, you know, it's a, an overview, some common threads that we can, uh, a common, an identification of a number of the approaches that we'll, we'll look at in more detail. And Havel's rules, uh, Havel's rules article is uh, a nice conceptual piece. We can go through that. Do you want to? You want to take a break? Good, good time to. Why don't we take a break?